Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I notice you took your jacket off, Joe. It is a little warm. Warm Yeah. I'm going to start taking some clothes off. Yeah, I'm Garth, and I'm alcoholic. Uh, firstly, I, I, I want to thank the committee uh, for their kindness and and uh, for this opportunity to 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 help and. Uh, and share uh, what uh, I was like and how I got better. I think the first thing I should do is uh, explain why you got me tonight instead of the speaker that's on the program. Uh, It's like this. Uh, About two and a half weeks ago, one of the young guys that uh, I sponsor, we were working together on the steps that night. We we're working on four and five, and six and seven. And uh, I, I, some of the defects that I talked to Michael about uh, were my tendency to 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 criticize and pass judgment and gossip about. And at and 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 at the end uh, of our prayer. Uh, he said, are you going to the conference this weekend? And I said, well, yeah, probably will. Uh, and he said, you know who's coming? And he went through a list of the speakers. And I don't know what the hell got into me, but I went into a tirade of gossip and judgment. And <laughs> I, I, I said, these circuit speakers coming from far away. And I, it, it was awful, really. And it wasn't based on fact, either. <laughs> uh, now... I felt real bad. I remember that night I had trouble sleeping after performing the, the way I did with, with my friend Michael, and I went back to him later because what had happened on Tuesday, uh, one of the committee members came to the, the meeting. It was about 15 of, 15 of us going through the steps, and they said, uh, one of the speakers is not coming. Uh, would you mind taking their place? And I thought, oh, my God, what have I I said? What have I done? And so I said to Michael, what do you think, Michael? He says, I think you better put your money where your mouth is. (laughs) That's why I'm here. So I know that you're looking for somebody from far away. And... I'm just from the group over on Gertrude Street, (laughs) the Winnipeg group. You know, we always say, well, I had my first drink when I was uh, less than 90 days old. And my father, we always called him OB. OB said to my mother, he said, that kid squawk, squawk, squawk. He says, put a few ounces of gin in in his bottle and maybe he'll stop. So he did that, and I, I, uh, I, I, I blacked out, and I passed out, and I peed in my pants. <laughs> and uh, and I, I therein set the pattern for the rest of my life. <laughs> when I started drinking... Uh, and I got serious about it in my uh, early uh, and mid-teens. I don't know what alcohol did for me, but it did something that was just completely different than anything I had ever experienced, like this. It, 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 it gave me a sense of being that was superior to any sense of being I'd ever had before. I, I, I knew something about a barrenness, uh, 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 an, an isolation, uh, uh, an aloneness. And when I drank, uh, that went away. Uh, 
I, I pursued that, that idea uh, for, for some time, and I discovered that uh, drinking would take me to all sorts of interesting places uh, before here. The saying is, uh, the alcoholic will take the drink, and then the drink takes the alcoholic. Uh, it took me uh, at, a, at a tender age to uh, first uh, skid row. Uh, out on the West Coast uh, for some time, and then I graduated uh, from there when I started to learn the system. And uh, I remember one uh, Christmas I, I spent in the Sally Ann in another city and vowed that that would never, never happen again. The following New Year's, I was in another Sally Ann in another city, and that wasn't the last time. Uh, my drinking uh, was taking me uh, also to uh, the odd jail for some short spurts. Uh, nothing too serious, but, you know, serious enough, antisocial enough, so that they said, we want you to stay here for a while. And, <laughs> and, and uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's another young guy here that, that I'm working with, and, and uh, I just can't tell you how great it is to, to be able to sponsor uh, these young guys because you, you just never know what's going to happen next. I mean, it's just amazing. As a matter of fact, and he would do this. He said, if you don't tell about the time you were a hobo, and I didn't want to tell this, he said, I'm going to stand up on the chair and disrupt the meeting. And, and he's, sitting, he's sitting right over there, and I know if I don't mention it, and I'll tell all I'm going to say, that at one time I was a... Oh, Tramp hobo for a while. Now we rode the rods and did the things that go with that. Now I've said it, uh, Matt, and that's all I'm going to say about that. As Forrest G said, that's all I'm going to say about that. In 1957, when I was uh, 20 years of age, I arrived at Alcoholics Anonymous. Same group I go to now, the Winnipeg group. A doctor uh, spotted the problem, and he was able to uh, talk me into uh, or encourage me to talk to a member of AA. And uh, Tommy, Tommy B came to see me. He's passed on. And he became a first sponsor and, and a great friend. Did I hear something? That's okay. I, I, I'm all right with that. Uh, I really am. Just wanted to make sure other people were hearing it. <laughs> Tom was an interesting guy and a great sponsor. He taught me a lot about the fellowship. Uh, first, he just talked about his alcoholism. He didn't talk about mine. And he took me over to his uh, his mansion. You know, they were very wealthy and and they had a big home and a, and, and a butler and a maid and an elevator in the home and all this kind of stuff. So I was really impressed with Alcoholics Anonymous. Right off the bat. My, my station in life was coming up rapidly. But, but then Tom took me to uh, the Winnipeg group and I found out that not only do you go to meetings, but you don't drink there. So I d didn't stay. I decided that uh, it was impossible. I could not visualize life without alcohol. It just didn't make any sense whatsoever. So I left for the next uh, uh, several years and some. Uh, sometimes I would go back for a very short stay, but mostly I just drank and uh, got crazy. I just drank and I got crazy. I worked a little here and there. Uh, went into uh, what we call a small business here and there. Uh, everything failed. Uh, no surprise. Uh, by this time, I, I had an opportunity to visit some other different jails, and uh, and then uh, then an experience at Psycho. Uh, Psycho is different than jail. Uh, and you know that if you've been there. Right? Uh, not only was I suffering from this this uh, this disease, alcoholism, as they tell us, you know, this obsession of my mind and this allergy of the body, and I, I had no trouble believing I had an allergy of the body because every time I took a drink, I did break out in trouble. So, so. 
But I had an attitude problem, too. There's no question about that. I had a lousy attitude. I had a something-for-nothing philosophy. I, I was spoiled terribly uh, as a kid, uh, not by my parents, but by my grand grandmother, and uh, I took advantage of that. And it was a long time learning that I had to take responsibility for my life. Other people are not going to take care of me, and they're not responsible for me. Uh, when I think about attitude, I think about uh, Sister Imelda. You know, one of the things that I do now is uh, I'm surrounded by women. I, I have women in my life all over the place, including I work uh, uh, some of the time for 35 uh, uh, Benedictine nuns. And uh, that's a, a very, very rewarding experience, believe me. And uh, it really is. I mean, I get all kinds of perks that pray for me, and, uh, which they do. They do. Uh, this, here's a great attitude for, 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 for a sister, uh, for a nun. Sister Amel is still alive. She's probably 90 now. When she was in her early 80s, uh, one of the uh, parishioners uh, came back uh, to the parish, and uh, he said, Sister Amel, I haven't seen you for such a long time. It's so good to see you. Could I, could I give you a big hug? Would it be all right? And she said, certainly it would, but just don't get into the habit. <laughs> no. This, 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 this is true. This is exactly what happened. Uh, so, so they're, they're, that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of people I like to be around. She just in 1962, uh, there was a Grey Cup uh, football game uh, in Toronto, and, and for those of you old enough to remember, it was called the Fog Bowl, and it, you couldn't see the game even if you were sober. Now. <laughs> You, you know, God, you're a good audience, because I, I mean, you're just laughing, and I, I didn't think I said anything funny. I mean, it's just, gosh. So what I want to get at is this. I went to this, this uh, I'm talking about drinking and alcoholism and the power of it and the, and the lack of control and, and the master of it that it was over me. Uh, in November, I went to the game. Uh, for the weekend, and came back in April. <laughs> now, I got into some trouble when I was down there, and 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 and, and they they locked me up in a, in a in a place for the winter, and and uh, and I got out. And I remember while I was in there, I made all sorts of plans, uh, how I was going to turn over a new leaf, change my life, and never drink again. And I was serious. I was dead serious. Because uh, I would read good literature and I would say my prayers and do all those sort of things when I was locked up. And when I got out, I really meant it. And I, and I, and I did pretty good for the first part of the day. Like I, I had, <laughs> I, 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 I had, I had uh, like bus tickets and I had gotten a, a dishwashing job and I had a room to stay in and, I, and a couple of other things and a few, a few shackles and that was about it. And, and, and I decided that when I had sort of gotten all this organized, I'm entitled to drink. And I thought, well, now I have to be prudent because I don't have much money. So I'll just get one of those little bottles of whiskey, and I'll go to the Brown Derby, and, and, and uh, I'll just put it onto the table and pour my drinks and maybe buy one drink there. Well, the outcome of this was another alcoholic arrived there, uh, all dressed up, and uh, I knew him. We had actually been heading me together. And he, 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 he was telling me that uh, things were wonderful in his life, and and I didn't want to sound any lesser. So uh, we, I'd been working in the brickyard at this, this Mimico prison that winter, and I was quite tanned and everything. And I said, well, I just spent the winter in Florida. So, so w we were pretending we both had money, and we just lied and lied and lied. And then, of course, we ran up a great big bill, which we couldn't pay. And then we had to run out, and we, we got in trouble. And uh, to make the story come to an end, uh, there was no job the next morning. We were throwing out of, thrown out of the rooming house, and, and uh, we were broke. So we had to get a car to get back here to Winnipeg, which we managed to get that belonged to somebody else. And when we got that car, and we took it back here mainly in low gear and, 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 and parked it uh, by the old Motel 75, and we checked in there. Now, I was crazy enough, but I think he was just as crazy, if not worse. And we would drink and drink, and then we would decide, we can't go on like this. 
what we need to do is we need to become patients in the Laughing Academy out at Selkirk. <laughs> so we realized that if we didn't do something like that, we wouldn't survive, and also the law would catch up with us. And if we got in there, we'd probably be okay. So we devised a plan, and then we'd get ready to go. But then we'd say, well, let's not be too hasty. Why don't we just go to the bottle shop and get some more whiskey and think it through a little better, and then, you know, make a proper plan. So we, we, we worked on that, and this went on for a, a few weeks. And by this time, it was a crazy, crazy place, because some of the other people that were coming over there weren't much better than us, but we were actually the lower company. You know, they, they say that about alcoholics. We go to lower and lower company. Well, what happened is uh, Doug's family took care of things because they came with a doctor and they carted him off to Selkirk Mental Hospital. And on the way out, he asked me if I was going to join him. I said, yes, I, I gave you my word I would, and I'll be there, Doug. You, you go ahead and get checked in. And, uh, uh, I'll be right behind you, buddy. You know? So, so, so... Uh, that's what, that's what he did, but I, 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 I went out to the airport and I wrote a bad check. You could do it in those days, and I flew to Florida. And so he's in the, on the fifth floor in Selkirk, and I'm in this big fancy hotel in Florida. But he's probably better off than I am because, you see, my family, uh, we've got a bunch of sisters and brothers, and I'm the oldest, and my mother is there. They live in this city in Florida that I was in, and I was so sh ashamed and so... So guilt-ridden, uh, uh, I didn't go to see them. Like, I, I just couldn't do that, you see, and, uh, except for a phone call at the end. Uh, I was in big trouble, and so I, I knew I had to do something about this drunk that I was on, because in the past I had never gotten off a drunk unless I, uh, once I went into the Arctic, and you know, I'd have to be locked up or something like that. I, I drank every day. And uh, I didn't actually know sometimes whether it was every day or every night, but it, I drank and drank and drank. And so I called uh, my psychi a psychiatrist, my psychiatrist, <laughs> a psychiatrist, who had looked after me in Seiko. And I, I said, uh, Doctor, if I can get back to Winnipeg, could you get me into to Selkirk Mental Hospital? And, and, and she said, you get back here and I'll take care of it. So, so I wrote another bad check. I flew back here. And... <laughs> And, and, and in those days, you could actually, you know, write a check. You could get on first class. And of course, you know, right? You could have a drink. Well, she, she did exactly what she said she would do. She, uh, she checked me into Selkirk, and my buddy was there. And by this time, he knew the ropes. And uh, we spent the summer there. Uh, we actually became uh, kind of famous in there. Uh, you see, the way it works is when you first go there, they lock you up on the on the top floor for observation, and 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 then as you get better, like they bring you down the floor and so on. Eventually, you're sort of like a trustee, and they let you go outside. And 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 that when they would do that, like we would take turns, and one of us would escape, and we'd run into Selkirk. You know, it's only a mile, right? And and uh, and we would get the whiskey, and we'd come back. And we would drink the whiskey, and we would get drunk, but, but we would give some to the patients sometimes. And that was not really a good idea because, you know, they were on medication and so on. And so, so, so this went on uh, for quite a while, but they would catch us, they being the doctor and the, and the male nurses, and then they would send us back up to the top floor. And, and we'd behave, and we'd get down to the bottom floor eventually and then back up. So we spent the summer going up and down and up and down and up and down. Eventually, uh, the, the psychiatrist that was taking care of us said, well, you guys are out of here. You know, you're obviously, you're, you're in here for treatment, for your alcoholism, and, and you're drunk. So well, there's people here who really need help, and rightly so. They threw us out, and we weren't so smart after all because the horsemen were waiting at the front door with the bracelets. And uh, uh, he, he, asked, he took me to, 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 to Vaughn Street, was still open in those days, and and then he took me to the airport. Something wrong? No. There's a lot wrong then. <laughs> and 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 he had. I remember he had on the uh, the, uh, the the scarlet jacket and you know the, the RCMP. He was beautiful and and I I had no socks. And uh, anyway, 
with the handcuffs and uh, onto the airplane, and uh, we fly to uh, to uh, Regina, and they, uh, they locked me up there for a while, and then they took me to Saskatoon, locked me up there for a while, then to Prince Albert, and then they locked me up there for a while, and I called Tom, my sponsor, and I said, Tom, you, can you get me out of here? I, I need help. I need some bail. And, you know, he had helped me a lot, a lot. But this time he helped me more than he'd ever helped me before because he said, I'm not going to help you this time. He says, you got yourself into that mess. You get yourself out. But as a sick alcoholic, I'll be there for you any time. And, you know, he was. And that was the best thing he could do because that was one more door that was closed. And when they were all closed, you know, we either sink or swim. Well, I made my way, I got out of there. I, I, I managed to get out of there on, well, the truth is I, I, I got bail and I jumped bail and skipped out of the province. <laughs> and, and I made my way to Clear Lake. And I, 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 met, I met Evelyn. And... and and Evelyn was going through her own deep tragedy at that time. And, uh, of course, I was crazy and drunk. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to make a life with her. I, I, I thought it would be good if we could get married. And uh, there was complications, of course. Uh, she was married to somebody else. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that, and, and there, was, there was other problems as well. So... Uh, we just couldn't seem to get together. You know, we were in the wrong place uh, or the, most of the time. And it, it reminds me of, the, of the, the farmer who, he went to the doctor for his annual medical. And uh, he did his medical. You know, the doctor says, you're in pretty good shape. How's your sex life? And he said, well, he says, it's not that great because... Uh, you know, I'm a farmer, and, and my wife is at the back at the house, and I'm out on the land, and, you know, the warm sun comes up, and, you know, we're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, and the doctor said, well, why don't you take a shotgun out to the field with you on the tractor, and when you feel amorous, he says, well, you could shoot off the shotgun, and your wife could hustle out to the field, and it might improve your sex life. So he says, okay, I'll try that. He came back next year for his medical, and uh, the doctor said, you know, you're okay. Uh, how's your health? Is it fine? He said, how's your wife? He said, she's dead. He said, well, well, what happened? Well, she, she ran herself to death during hunting season. <laughs> so, so, My wife is here tonight, and, you know, it eventually did happen. Now, we've been, we've been married a long, long time, but at that time, we just couldn't seem to pull it off. Uh, I had a couple of incidents. I don't know, don't think I have time to talk about taking off my clothes. Uh, <laughs> I don't mind, uh, you know, discussing at the time I, I did it while I was uh, while I was drunk. Uh, there was four of us driving from Western Canada on our way to Montreal to go back up into the Arctic, and it was a hot, hot day in dusty Saskatchewan, and we pulled over and we all jumped into this little brook for a swim. You know, we just peeled off, buck naked, and in we went. But there was a fairly strong current, and I was showing off a little. I was a good swimmer. So I took off, but the current took me, and first thing, I was probably a mile away, and I couldn't get back. So I got no clothes on, and there, the problem was, I, I, you know, I got out of the water, but the grass was about this high, and I have never seen so many mosquitoes in my whole life. Like, I don't see anybody, well, that lady's got something on with a bright, bright red on it. My whole body was just that color from these mosquitoes. And I'm running through these fields, which is maybe another mile to find a highway so I can get a ride. Now, when I get out on the, I'll get out on the highway, and some of these cars are coming by, but they wouldn't stop. Like, I, I had a bunch of this long grass, I remember, like, and I, I put it in front of me, and then I put it behind me, and then in front of me like that. 
and I, I, the odd car would come and slow down, and then they'd just take off like that. Eventually, a, a traveling salesman came by. He says, God almighty, what's going on? You know, get in the car, you young know, this and that. Anyway, he's, I says, well, it's down there someplace. So he drove me back to where my friends were. And God, they were, you know, worried sick. One of them was trying on my jeans. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you about the time I took my clothes off on the golf course four years ago. I was sober, and uh, I don't know what got into me. I really don't. My poor wife was with me and a friend, and I had a new $500 driver, and I threw it in the pond in front of the clubhouse, and that's all I'm going to say. But... <clears throat> <laughs> Those expensive drivers, they'll float. Uh, so, I, and I wanted to finish the game. I didn't want to be all wet, so I had no choice. I had to take off all my clothes and swim out, not that far, but get the driver and come back. It was the coming back and climbing out over the rocks, facing the clubhouse in the glassed-in dining room, you know, where people were eating. I, to this day, I don't know what got into me. So this business of sanity returning, it, it's a slow thing. It's a slow thing. Slow thing. Slow thing. Very quickly, uh, I was uh, uh, drunk. And then Brandon and a guy by the name of Harry came along. And uh, Harry said, let's go on a road trip. That meant something to him and I and, and the like. Us. So uh, we headed out uh, down through the northwest states and so on and so forth. And, and ha I said, Harry, you know, I can't drive because I'm drunk all the time. He says, don't worry about it. He says, I haven't had a drink for four years. I didn't realize he was taking pills. And that's pretty common now, but, but then it wasn't quite so common, and I wasn't quite so perceptive either. So, so we went on this trip, and I... I got really, really strange. Uh, we would check into a, a hotel, and if it wasn't on the main floor, I, I would have to get Harry to help me pile the furniture uh, uh, against the window. Uh, I, I later uh, read in Bill's story that uh, he, he thought he could not contain himself from bursting through sash and all and jumping out the window. I know exactly what he felt because that was exactly, I felt there was a power that I could not do anything about, and that I would throw myself through the window. So every time we stayed in a place, this is what we would do. And then I started to hallucinate uh, while I was drinking. And uh, I don't remember a whole lot about this trip, except I started to make my way back to Brandon. I had a plan, and, and uh, Harry, he didn't make it back. He got to Battleford, North Battleford, and he died. Uh, in the institution there. Anyway, young guy, too. We we're both young at the time. And anyway, I got back to Brandon, and uh, things were going from bad to worse, and I was just drinking and drinking and drinking, and uh, the progression of my, my, my disease uh, was obvious to everybody, uh, I guess, except myself. I, I knew that I had to get into the uh, mental hospital, if I was going to get sober, I guess I've been drunk maybe nine or ten months that time, something like that. And I called the Brandon Mental Hospital, and, and they said, no, we won't take you, because we know you were in Selkirk, and we know what you did there, and whatever they said. It's a little foggy. So I decided I will force them to take me. I'll kill myself, and they'll have to take me. <laughs> so, so, so I did that. I... Uh, I finished off the wine that I had in, in this hotel, and, and, I, and I, got the, uh, I got the blade out, and I started to cut. And I actually cut a little deeper than I had planned. <laughs> and I got real scared, because I thought I was going to die. And, because I did it here, you see. And now, the night before, I was buying drinks for everybody in the bar. Uh, of course, I wasn't intended to pay for it. 
That night, I'm running through the lobby with no shirt and blood coming out of my neck. Help, 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 I'm dying. Please, somebody help me. And, and I'm making phone calls to the police and the medics. And the taxi came first. They took me to the hospital. The young doctor sewed me up. He says, young man, you know where you're going, don't you? I says, yes, I think I do, up on the hill. That's what it's referred to in Brandon. Brandon Mental Hospital means up on the hill. It's closed now. So, so uh, Walter came and picked me up. And uh, I know one guy in here at least remembers Walter, uh, and uh, my wife was with him. At that time, my wife was not a member of Al-Anon. She didn't know anything about alcoholism. And, and I'm in the car, and Walter's there, and she's there, and he's driving me to the nut ward, and I'm all bandaged up, and Walter says, oh, he ain't bad yet. <laughs> Jesus. Well, you know, there was truth in what he said. I think what he was saying is, I, I, I wasn't finished. He's, I don't know how he, he sort of knew that. Because when I went into that mental institution, uh, this time when I wanted to leave, it was different. Like, they didn't want to let me go when I wanted to go. Like before, you know, I was a volunteer patient. This time was different. But I managed to get out on a promise that I, that I would definitely go to AA and I would not drink. And I made it almost through that first day. And I was drunk, of course. Uh, sometime later... I was living in a bootleggers here in Winnipeg one winter, and that was my home. And uh, a great friend of mine, uh, another Tom, who uh, he, he heard some he heard some 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 sort of a medical assessment, a report from Selkirk Mental about the condition of my my head, and. The two Toms actually got together on this, and, and, and they said, we've got to find this guy and, and tell him what this is. Just, we think it's that important. So he didn't know if I was even in Canada, but he did group me out. And he came there, and he, he said, I, I, I didn't want to leave, but he says, if you come with me, I promise to drive you back. So he took me down to the Winnipeg group, middle of the night, maybe, I don't know, 1, 2 o'clock. And what he did for me is, well, I think he saved my life. He, he he explained the malady of the illness. He talked about the hopelessness of my alcoholism. He talked about the obsession of my mind. Merciless obsession and the compulsion. It would mean I'd have to keep drinking and drinking and drinking. And that I would never get any better. I would only get worse. And then he told me, drop the other shoe. He says, here's what the psychiatrists say. If you come back to that institution, the chances are pretty good that they'll throw the key away. They think that your brain is in uh, that kind of a condition now. So you're really pushing it. Now, you know, when we hear the truth, even when we're in our cups, uh, the bell rings. And I just knew what he was saying was right. But I didn't know how I could live without drinking. So I said, take me back to that bootleggers. And I got back to the bootleggers, and I poured a big, big glass of whiskey. And I was shaken because I heard the truth. And I got it down, and I drank it. And I continued to drink. I don't know how much longer. Uh, maybe uh, maybe it was a year later. And I uh, found myself on the road going north to Dauphin. And uh, I remember very clearly everything I owned was in a small envelope. Uh, <laughs> not even a big envelope. Was, maybe I had 60 cents and a toothbrush. And the reason, I had somebody else's clothes on. I had Jerry, Jerry's clothes on. I had on his shoes and his, uh, his pants and his shirt and jacket and everything belonged to somebody else. And I remember the feeling of loneliness and isolation. Now, I'd been in worse shape, worse places. But this time, there was a complete barrenness. And the loneliness, I can't, well, that's it. That's the word. You know, somebody said there used to be a big sign when you fly into uh, one of the airports in New York. And a big sign said alcoholism, the lonely illness, you know. So, so I remember it was kind of defeat, finally. That's the way it felt. I was going north because, as I said earlier, I had jumped bail from the west and I had problems with the law in the east in Ontario and I had been deported from the United States. 
So there was only one direction, and that was north. <laughs> yeah. So when I got to when I got to to to, uh, to to Dauphin, I went to see a Catholic priest, and I had, I had used this on occasion, and I wanted to get some money to keep the drunk going. And he refused to give me any money. He says, let's talk about you. And, you know, we talked for about three hours, or mainly he talked and I listened. And out of that meeting, somehow the, 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 the uh, spirit of God uh, took place enough in within me, through him, uh, for a decision out of me to go back to AA and try it again. And I'm so grateful to this guy. I mean, not all priests are exactly the same. Most, I know a lot of them, and most of them are really, really good. No question about it. Uh, Patty had an experience. Uh, uh, actually, Patty's dog died, and he went to see his priest. And he said, Patty, would you say a mass from a dear dead dog? And the priest said, well, Patty, we don't say services for animals. If you go down and see the, the Baptist down the road, they'll, they'll do it. And he said, oh, okay. And would you think maybe, uh, Father, $1,500 would be about right? Oh, Lord Jesus, Patty, I didn't know your dog was Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm Catholic, so I can say things about priests. <laughs> uh, I got sober that time in Dauphin. I was sober a month, two months, three months, four months. Had never been sober that long, just on the street like that. And made my way down to Brandon because that's where Evelyn was. And I went to meetings, and her and I spent a lot of time uh, actually at a kid's uh, swimming pool one summer, just sitting around in the sun. It was kind of a healing time. And I didn't do much, worked just a little bit, went to AA. I was approaching uh, about 10 or 11 months, and I started to look around, and everybody in AA was doing better than me. I was still a complete failure in every department. First thing I knew, I was drunk again. And I was drunk. Oh, God. This progression. This time, it's real foggy, but thank God for the AAs and how they 12-stepped me and Brandon. First, they stole my car. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was the wise thing to do. And I got into a motel, and I got crazy and wild, and I don't know what I was doing, but the police came, and, and then the AAs came, and they said, well... Don't 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 lock him up. We think that we can maybe get this this fellow back to the program. So they took turns. I, they stayed there around the clock until I, I got straightened around. And they took me back to AA. Well, I was reluctant, but I I, did, I was finally defeated. I was defeated, and you know, defeat has to produce a result. Dr. Thibault, our friend, told us that. Now, it can produce different results, but the result that it has to produce for us is surrender. And thank God that's what happened through that defeat. Reluctant, yes, but I was defeated, and I said, I'm teachable. So I went with the AAs, and I went to meetings, and I did what they told me to do. And that was in 1965, in the spring, and I haven't had to take a drink since then. So, now, that's not to say I didn't want to take a drink. And as you know, just because we go to AA doesn't mean that the surrender is, is, is that complete. Uh, uh, on one occasion, I remember uh, uh, traveling uh, on a sales job, and I was up in, uh, in, in this town, and uh, I went into the hotel, and I, I knew I had to go into the bar. And I was sober, I don't know, four, five, six months. I just knew nothing could stop me. I had to drink. So I went up into the room first, and I made a phone call to my sponsor. I said, Tom, I, I can't stay out of that bar. What am I going to do? He says, try the kneecaps. 
So we hung up, and I got on my knees, and I prayed, and I asked God for help. And my prayer was answered this way. I got up and got a piece of paper out of the drawer and I started to write down, if I go down to that bar, here are all the things I'm going to lose. And by the time I got down to the end, end of the page, the obsession was lifted for that time. That's how that prayer was answered then. On another occasion, I was sober a few months. Uh, certainly it was in the first year. And I went to the bottle store and I got a bottle of whiskey and I went back to the rooming house that I was living in. And I started talking to this bottle like it was a person. And I was saying things like, well, I'm going to drink you, but you know I can't drink you because I'm an alcoholic and you'll kill me and I know I'll die, but you can't make me drink and I don't know what was going on. But I just knew that I was going to drink. And I took the top off. And I remember saying, God, I need a miracle. Like, I cannot stop myself from taking this drink, so you have to do it for me. And as I was about to take the drink out of that bottle of whiskey, the doorbell rang. And what was really strange is Evelyn was at the door. I was supposed to be in Saskatchewan, she thought. She had never been to that place before. She got off work early, and for some strange reason, she was led to go over there and press that button just as I was going to take the drink. So I didn't take the drink. So you see, on one occasion, I called my sponsor, Tom, and he sent me God. And the next occasion, I call God, and he sent me heaven. It works. We have to reach out and ask. We got married and had some kids, and we've been married a long time, four decades plus. And Alan, Evelyn got into Al-Anon, and, uh, and uh, we were sober, and uh, I was sober. Of course, she was sober. And... Uh, 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 but you know, I, I, I wasn't, I was suffering. Wait a minute, I gotta get this right. I told you I did what I was told to do. Well, people said, you, you, you need to go to the meetings at the jail, go to the meetings at the mental hospital, go to the meetings at your club, carry the message. So I did all of those things for several years. For nine years, actually. Someone says, why don't you uh, get involved with the service structure? Which I did. And all these things were good. No question about it. But I have to tell you that I was suffering still from untreated alcoholism because I had not dealt with who I was, what was going on in here. What are the symptoms of untreated alcoholism? Well, you know, they're in your life when you were there. They were in my life, and some of them are still there. Uh, not too serious anymore, but for me, they were... Anger, dishonesty, depression, uh, and a whole lot of other uglies. Uh, my poor wife sometimes used to say, Garth, I'm not the enemy. I wouldn't talk to her sometimes for weeks. I couldn't communicate. I didn't know anything about intimacy. Three beautiful daughters. I couldn't be the proper father or the proper husband. I used to go into uh, 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 one of my rooms, and that was my sulk room. So <laughs> I, would, I would go silent sulking. You know, that really, that really is good for a marriage. Oh, boy. Mm. Yeah. And you get pretty proficient at it after a while. After a while, you get to the point where they think they're to blame. You see? And you know, when we get to same step four, we begin to discover we've got to look at it a little differently. Well, so I was just moving along here in sobriety uh, throughout this nine years, uh, doing some good things, but still suffering from untreated alcoholism. And then in 1965, a guy by the name of Paul from Chicago came to speak at a conference in Brandon. And he had a message for me. His message was, if I was willing to adopt these steps, these spiritual tools into my life, uh, I could be healthy. Not only sober, but I could be healthy. I resisted him for a long time. My last line of defense was, once I come to know my God better, then I'll do your steps. His retort was, maybe if you do the steps first, then you'll come to know your God. Of course, he had me. 
I was trying all sorts of different things at the time. I was into self, self-help, uh, reading all the books I could get my hands on, trying auto-suggestion, uh, uh, transmutation of, of my sexual energy. I've got to tell you about this. Oh, geez. This is a winner. Right. This is, this is, now, okay, I'm living in a married state, and, uh, you know, we were younger then. And with a very healthy wife. And I reasoned that if I could convert my, my, my sexual energy into spiritual energy, that I could soar into the enlightenment. And, and I tell my sponsor about this. I said, you know, I says, Paul, I know, I know a guy who uh, lived in a married state. He was a very, very holy man. And, you know, he never had sex with his wife for 50 years. Well, he said... Maybe if you saw his wife, you wouldn't want to have sex with her either. <laughs> Another time I was, uh, I was looking at uh, uh, what's called life reading. Some of you may know what that is. And I was trying to find out what I was in another lifetime. Imagine that. So I was telling him about that. He says, why are you doing that? Well, I said, if I understood what I was in a different lifetime, maybe I could handle this one better. He says, you jackass, you can't even handle this one. (laughs) So so, uh, I was standing in the middle uh, of the solution, but I was looking elsewhere for quite a long time until this guy came along and uh, convinced me that there was another way. And he, well, He had, he had written a, written a lot of articles uh, in, in, during the 70s and early 80s in the grapevine. He was a writer by profession, and uh, uh, he wrote one on prayer and meditation. And uh, when he spoke, I, I came up to him and said, I'd like to talk to you about prayer and meditation. And uh, he, he said, well, uh, what about your amends? And what about four and five and so on? Have you done that? And, and I said, I've done some of it, but... You know, he asked me a few more questions. He could see that there was a war going on inside, and that I wasn't quite ready for, we'll say, meaningful meditation until I did my part to clear up the wreckage of my past. In the fourth step, I'm, I'm presented with an opportunity to not only discover what the problems are that block me from God, but I'm given the solutions. And I'm happy to discover and say that our program, our steps, all of our steps uh, identify problems, yes, but they also identify solutions. A couple of guys took me over to see a friend of AA, Big Monsignor Empson, one time, and they left me there, and uh, they had a plan, and this guy started to talk to me, and and I knew right away that if I was ever going to tell anybody my secrets, I'd tell him. He said to me, you go on home and you think about the worst thing you've ever done. So I don't care what other people think. What do you think is the worst thing you've ever done? You know those nightmare memories, those revolting episodes? So I did that. And for the first time, when it came up into my mind, I held it there and I looked at it. In the past, I had always wrestled it out or suppressed it or tried to wrestle it out. But this time I really looked at it. And once I looked at the worst, I could fill the page with other, with other items. And I rushed back to him and I, and I told him all about it. At that time, I, I, I couldn't analyze the resentment. I mean, that was impossible. I didn't know anything about it. That was the best I could do was talk about the nature of certain things and what I had done. Uh, you know, uh, alcoholics sometimes we're, we're accused of having alcoholic Alzheimer's, right? Uh, we forget everything but our resentments. And uh, I, I still do that sometimes. Uh, it's important for me to recognize that, uh, as someone else said, that I am and was the maker of my own misery. Other people are not responsible. Regardless of injustice that may have been caused to any of us, we can't do anything about that. But we can do a lot about what we did. I can do a lot about what I did. And the program, the steps, show me how to do that. 
That's the wonderful discovery that's there. They show me how to somehow get this relationship going with this God that we are told is within all of us. This God that was shut down in me because of my false self. My, 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 my true self, my God self, I guess intellectually, I thought, yeah, it makes some sense. But I was afraid to look there and didn't believe I would ever find God within myself anyway because there was too much darkness covering it all over. So, well, darkness and guilt. God had enough guilt to start my own religion. Uh, it's just the way we drink. It's the way we are. Uh, guilt and shame. And I need to dismantle this false self. And it takes quite a while. It doesn't happen overnight. But it's important that I start the journey and stay on the spiritual path. And these 12 steps will are, are true. They'll take me in the right direction. They're perfectly safe. They're not going to cause any harm. Sometimes we may get bruised. We may be uncomfortable. But sometimes it's painful. But it takes us to where we're supposed to go. I was very private in many ways. I didn't think I was, but I didn't want people to know anything about me. So uh, I would say secret. And you know the saying, if we stay secret, I stay sick. Uh, what I need to do in, in, in terms of, of the fifth step, for instance, is to invite the eyes of others on my behavior. And I've discovered when I do that, I'm compelled to change. If I don't want to change, I won't tell you. I won't show you. It just works like that. It's so simple. You know, I don't know how many uh, fifth steps I've heard. Several hundred. And I've done an equal amount. And you know, they're pretty well all the same. Uh, different places, different times, different things. I mean, there are some exceptions. But basically, we're very much the same. Well, I hope this is okay. I mean, uh, some exceptions, yeah. Uh, this young guy was, uh, well, it was an old guy, actually. He was sitting on the bench. And a uh, young guy came along. And he had uh, spiked hair. And he had all those colors. All the colors of the rainbow. And uh, the old guy stared at him. The young guy said, what's wrong with you, old timer? Have you ever done anything wild? The young guy, the old guy looked at the young guy and says, yeah, I got drunk once and had a relationship with a peacock. I was wondering if you were my son. <laughs> a lot of the stuff is the same. Really, it's, it's not that different. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, uh, after about 20 years in a business uh, that I ran with some success, uh, I had a business failure. I had a business failure because I uh, was dishonest. Just little dishonesties crept into my business. I allowed it to happen. And about that time, uh, I became uh, rather self-righteous, judgmental. I, I was suffering from spiritual pride, for sure, and lots of other pride and vanity. And I got myself into some trouble, and the trouble I got into brought anguish, pain into the life of my family. Now, Paul taught me that the steps are not a one-time climb. We can work them and work them and work them. And if we do, we'll get better, eventually. Well, with this particular item, I, I couldn't seem to get free. And I stepped five did a lot. 
And, but one time, when I was confessing, this person said to me, I don't think it's guilt you got anymore. I think you had guilt, yes, but you're free of that now. What you have is sorrow. And I want to say this, I share this because I, it can help somebody. There is a difference. I was also told that one can have sorrow. We're truly sorry for the hurt that we have caused. We can have sorrow and still be useful, and we can even live cheerfully. We can go on to experience forgiveness, and in that experience we learn to forgive others. I think that uh, the uh, willingness that uh, I'm called to, to change, is uh, the most difficult part of the, the whole program. And I won't spend much time on it because I'm running out of time, but I'll just say that uh, when we get to that place where we say, okay, I've identified what's wrong and I've confessed it, and now am I really willing to do something about it? Or am I kidding myself? Am I lying to myself? Am I willing? Maybe not all of the things, but just some, one day at a time. And I have to answer that question with some honesty. This is the point where we depart from the focus on ourselves in our recovery process to out to others. Now we're starting to grow. And hopefully I have enough humility to recognize I cannot do this by myself. I must have God's help. And AA gives me a prayer that I can use on a daily basis that will carry me in that direction. And as you well know, it goes like this, my creator. I am now willing that you would have all of me, the good and the bad. I pray that you remove from me every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. The good and the bad, we don't have to reach any particular measure of spirituality. We just come as we are. I used to think that if I was good, God would reward me. If I was bad, God would punish me. Now I believe whether I'm good or bad, it doesn't matter. I don't change God. God's love is constant. It's there regardless. I just need to say a few things about the eighth and ninth step before closing. Because I do believe that we can do a lot of good work with the earlier steps, and if we don't, if I don't, carry on with the restitution and the amends that I'm called to do in the eighth and ninth step, I cannot get better. The spirit of this step, of course, is that we take full responsibility for our own lives. We no longer are a victim, as I was at the doorstep of number four. Moved away from victimism. One time a uh, friend of mine who was not an AA member said to me, Garth, you're dragging the past with you all the time. He says, you remind me of somebody that's pulling a little red wagon with them. And uh, uh, he says, the red wagon is full of these, uh, you the older folks will remember, uh, these old glass, dirty milk bottles. And it has a round paper cork on the top. And he said, every now and again you stop and you, you uncork one of those uh, dirty old milk bottles and you smell a memory the, from negative old smelly memory from the past. And Ah, I said, I see. So I should stop smelling those, those, those milk, milk bottles. No, no, he said, stop pulling the little red wagon. Oh. <laughs> Well, that's what step eight and nine does for me. It shows me how to let go of it. And uh, that's vital. Two friends of mine, one I'll call Ray, the other guy is Dennis. One was sober 12 years, the other was sober 13 years. The first guy was sober 12 years, he had such depression that he'd have to go for shock treatment. By his own admission, he told me he never went past the second step. But he brought a lot of people to AA. He was a great 12-stepper. Him and another guy. Eventually, 
Ray died a violent death. He drank and he killed himself. The other guy was Dennis. This is his real name. Dennis was sober 13 years and uh, he had such trouble with depression, uh, untreated alcoholism, that he lost his family. His wife left, his children left, his profession left, lost his job. He ended up meeting a, a doctor who suggested shock treatments. Before the shock treatments, he met my sponsor, Paul, and Paul said to him, well, do you want to try working these steps before you go back and see Dr. Electro? He said, what do you got to lose? So Dennis said, okay, let's give it a whirl. So for the next, I don't know, two, three, four years, he really worked hard for many years after that. The message is, Dennis, his family came back, his work came back, his depression went away. Uh, you, you, you couldn't meet somebody who was more comfortable to be around. Great sense of humor, a happy guy. What's the difference? One guy dies, he didn't work the steps, wouldn't work the steps, he said so. The other guy did work the steps, and he lives. It is life that we experience. That we do what we're called to do in recovery. In my own case, I'd built up a case against my father, an alcoholic father who drank for 50 or 60 years. And uh, I, uh, I went to see him uh, down in PEI. And uh, I told him that I had thought about our lives and I was sorry for the embarrassment and the whatever harm I had caused him. I, I did believe I was probably only 10% wrong in the relationship, but I was wrong. I couldn't do anything about his part in it. Well, when I told him that I was sorry, and I put my arms around him, and I told him that I loved him. Now, for him and I, this is really strange, because like a couple of icebergs, and he was really uncomfortable with this. And, you know, we can make amends if we make people, we can't make amends if we harm them, but there's nothing wrong with making them uncomfortable. Sometimes that has to happen, right? And he was uncomfortable, I was uncomfortable, but, but I got my arms around him, and I was hanging on to him, and he was just struggling like a tiger, because he, he hated that, you know? And, and I told him I loved him, and, you know, he, his tears started to come down here. And I could feel him kind of relax, like in my arms. And I wasn't going to let him go because it took, you know, a lot of years to get to his place, right? So I hung on really good. Well, I just want to say that as a result of making amends in that situation, there has been a definite healing in this father-son relationship. No question. That doesn't mean that sometimes he couldn't, he's passed on, but he couldn't touch the button <laughs> and still get the resentment to come up. And at first, I didn't understand. I thought, well, I thought I forgave him. Well, now I have learned I did forgive him, and we can forgive and still feel some resentment now and again. Okay. It's good to understand that. It was good for me to understand that. But it was a healing experience to do that because it changed my relationship not only there but with others as well, and most importantly with my God. You know, this business in uh, step two where it talks about uh, God within, all of us. Uh, okay, that's so simple. Uh, what do I do? I work these steps. Uh, I dismantle this false self. And I better discover and enter into this relationship with my God. And as I enter into this relationship with my God, I enter into meaningful relationships with others, especially the people I live with, our loved ones. It's so simple. <laughs> you know, I say it's, it's got to be more complicated than that. And it should cost a whole lot of money, too. <laughs> but it's free right? and simple. But it works. 
And the eleventh step, uh, after entering into the world of the spirit, at least somewhat in ten, and taking some time, uh, which my sponsor insists on and has for a long time in his 57 or 58 years of sobriety and his 50 years in, in the practice of meditation uh, for long periods every day of his life pretty well. He's got me doing something similar uh, for the last 25 years or so, uh, not as long as he does. But what takes place for me, and we each find our own way to do this, is I just simply pick a time each morning uh, to be totally quiet and to sit in God's presence and try not to expect anything or ask for anything, uh, just to be there and know that God's healing power is working and there's even an unloading of the unconscious uh, that's taking place uh, there's levels beneath the levels, and our steps will get to many, many levels. But I think there are probably levels that only God can heal. And in meditation, God's action is taking place, and there's a healing that's going on. And I don't even have to understand it. That's not important. I only have to put the time in on a regular basis. And if I show up, God will show up. And uh, it's an awakening that we've been promised. An awakening in the twelfth step, which really is for us, for me, a message of light, a message of life, a message of love. It's major league stuff. We're in the business of saving lives. And we save a lot of them. Families are put back together. We save lives as you have saved mine. And I thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.